One of the most consistent themes of the New Testament is the promise and hope of the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is the fourth message in the series, Life After Life. The message is entitled, How Will the World End? Part One. Here is Pastor Dale O'Shields. We're continuing our series entitled, Life After Life, and I want to answer a question this weekend and next weekend. I will not be able to completely answer this question, but I will try to give you as much as I know from Scripture about the answer to this question. And the question is, how will the world end? When we talk about life after life, it's impossible to really consider it without thinking about how this world is going to end. What is life going to be like after life on planet Earth? And how should we be properly prepared for it? How does it all end? In theological terms, this is something called eschatology. It comes from a Greek word that means end or end times. And we usually refer to eschatology as the study of last things, the study of death and judgment and the final destiny of souls and the final destiny of mankind. And if you've studied any realm of theology, any dimension of theology, you'll you'll know that there are different schools of thought when it comes to eschatology in terms of how the world is going to end. And what I want to do for this weekend and next weekend. I was going to actually try to cover all this in one message, but as I studied and realized, my goodness, there's no way that I can get all this information out in one message, so I decided to break it into two parts as as a part of this series. I'm going to do my best to try to present to you what the Bible says and what I believe to be the case regarding the second coming of Jesus Christ and the end of the world. I want to encourage you to listen closely. This is not one of those messages that necessarily will touch on a particular what you feel like, well, I've got problems in my life right now, and why is he talking about the second coming? And I'm telling you that you need to understand the second coming of Jesus because it will help you with the problems in your life. It'll help you to know how to look forward to what Christ is going to do when he comes back again, the fact that he's ruling and reigning, and what he wants to do in your life today. And so I really want to encourage you to listen very closely. As a Christian, you need to understand something about the last days. I'm going to put up, again, what we've had for the last couple of weeks, this little diagram that you see here. I want to explain it to you. Again, All of us enter into life. Uh, We believe here that the Bible teaches that life begins at the time of conception, that as soon as you are conceived in your mother's womb, you are a gift of God. God knows you from the moment of your conception. Life is sacred. We believe in the sanctity of life. You're in your mother's womb for nine months. You come out into this world, and you have a birthday, and you celebrate that birthday generally every year, and people come around. They give you some cake, and I ice cream, and if you can, you blow the candles out. The older you get, the harder it is, but you try to blow those candles out. You celebrate, I lived another year, and I'm going in to another year, so it's a a birthday, and then you live X number of years, and that little dash represents the number of years that you're going to live. No one knows what those years are, and one day you will come to your moment of death, and you will have a death certificate that will mark your day of death, so a birth certificate and a death certificate and a life in between. But your life is not the only life there is. Life, you're in the midst of a world and a particular generation, and you have things that have happened before you came into being, and that will continue after you're gone from this life. And so there's a a big picture of history that is at work that you and I are just a part of in a segment of time. And so this big picture of history, I want you to think with me for a moment, sort of above that life-death line there, and you'll see kind of in between intermediate paradise, intermediate Hades, a line going across that describes ongoing history heading toward the end times. When you die, you will go to one of two places. You will go to an intermediate paradise, as the thief on the cross was promised by Jesus. When Jesus said, said, today, you will be with me in paradise, that's not the final heaven that is an intermediate state until the final judgment happens, or an intermediate Hades. That's where we see in Luke chapter 16 the story of Lazarus and the rich man, and the rich man died, did not know God. He's in Hades while Lazarus is in paradise. You can read that story. But for life, life continues even after you've left this world, and it's moving toward 
an event of history. And during this time, two things are happening historically. The gospel of Jesus Christ continues to be preached, and the kingdom of God continues to advance. Aren't you glad to know that Jesus is continuing to do his work? Even after you die and go to heaven, God's work doesn't stop. It continues until Christ comes back again. And so we're living in a world where the gospel of Jesus is being preached and people are being saved and people are coming to faith in Christ and learning how to have a relationship with God and learning his word and living in his kingdom. So all that will continue to the end. And at the same time as that is continuing, there's something else very diabolical that is continuing, and that is the increase of evil and the increase of tribulation that will ultimately come to a point in time in history where I believe, and we'll read today a little bit more about it, there will be a culminating point where light and darkness will be at such a clash. It brings to bear in history something called the Battle of Armageddon, the revelation of someone that we will know to be the Antichrist. There's already the Antichrist spirit in the world today. Anything that refuses to acknowledge Jesus as an Antichrist spirit, but I believe it will be ultimately, it will ultimately come to head in a particular personality or institution that will be very, very persecutory, if you will, toward Christians, and a great tribulation will happen, and that will bring about the last day battle and the second coming of Jesus Christ that will result in the final judgment and the ultimate assignment for eternity to heaven, which actually heaven is a new heaven and a new earth. I'll talk more about that, not just a place up in the sky somewhere where you float around on a cloud and play a harp for the rest of your life. That's not what heaven is, Uh, and, and, and there's an eternal hell, which is eternally being separated from God. This is the overall picture of movement toward the final judgment and the final last days. I want to talk to you today about four things that you need to know from Scripture about these things that we're talking about. Four very important points. I'll bring four more to you next weekend. But the first thing today is a very significant fact that you need to clearly get into your heart and mind. It will change the way that you think and it will change the way that you live. And that is this, a final day is scheduled for this world. A final day is scheduled for this world. We have a tendency to think that life and the world as we know it is going to continue forever, and this is absolutely not true. The Bible teaches that a final day is coming, and there will be a final day in life and history where things will be different from anything we've ever known before, that this world will come to a sudden cataclysmic end, something new will be established. This is very clear in Scripture. And by the way, let me just digress for a moment. Today really is going to be Bible study day. I'm going to give you at least 17 passages of Scripture. So it's not going to hurt us. You need a lot of God's Word inside of you. So I'm going to give you a lot of Scripture that backs up what I'm talking about today. And you'll need to go back and study these on your own. Listen to what uh, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, about this final day. But the day of the Lord will come. It doesn't say it might come. It says he, it will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Clear, clear, clear point here. The day of the Lord, judgment day, will come. Matthew 24, Jesus. Jesus himself speaking to his disciples, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Think with me for a moment about the days of Noah. No one believed Noah's preaching. 
Noah was preaching that a judgment day was coming. And while he was preaching, he was building an ark. And he was inviting people to sign up, reservations for the ark. And nobody would believe him until the last day. And God put them in the ark and shut the door. And then rain started coming down. And there was a 40 days of flooding that happened. And God's judgment came just as it was predicted. And you and I need not doubt it. A final day is scheduled for this world. This world will not continue forever as it is. Number two, the Bible teaches that we don't know the date of the final day. While we know that the final day is coming, we do not know the day or we do not know the hour of its coming. Jesus reminded us that the final day, this last day when the world will ultimately end, is only known by God the Father. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Matthew 24, 42. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Acts 1, verse 7, as Jesus is getting ready to ascend back into heaven, he said to them, to his disciples, they were asking, when's the kingdom going to come? When will all this last stuff happen? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. We don't know the date of the final day. And by the way, it would not be healthy for us to know. Some of you would live like the devil till the last 24 hours, okay? okay, okay. Oh my goodness, there's a day. I see it on the calendar. Better get right with God. No, it's not healthy for us to know. God left that a secret because he wants us to live in the expectation. It's not as though he's trying to withhold information from us. He, in fact, is preparing history in such a way that we'll be ready for it. Never believe any person that tells you they know when Jesus is coming back again. Don't believe it. I remember in 1988, and some of you are saying, 1988, when was that? That was a long time ago. Okay. I remember in 1988, I remember there's a book, a very popular book that came out by a particular radio evangelist, and the title of this book was 88 Reasons the Rapture, 88 Reasons Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. I didn't even have to read the book. I knew he was wrong, okay? Because the Bible says no one knows the day or no one knows the hour. Everybody's grabbing this book as though, yes, indeed, Jesus is coming back. There are 88 reasons why Jesus is going to come back in 1988. Well, guess what? It's 2022, and Jesus didn't come back in 1988. Why? Because no one knows the day and no one knows the hour when Jesus Christ will return. So there is a final day that is scheduled. And does anyone know that day? No. I'll ask you this question. Think about it in your own life. Are you going to die? Yes. Are you certain you're going to die yes. unless Jesus comes back again, right? Are you certain you're going to die? Yes. When? Nobody knows, right? But you can be certain of something without knowing the day, or without knowing the hour, or without knowing the schedule, the calendar moment that it's going to occur. So a final day is scheduled. Understand this. The world is not going to continue as it is. We don't know when it's going to happen. Number three, there are signs. There are signs that the final day is near. While we don't know when the final day is scheduled... We're not left without warnings about its nearness. And before you look at the signs of the times, before we look at some of those things, I want you to understand a few things about the last days. And I'm going to explain about four things that are very important to understand that help us to grasp this idea of the signs of the last day. First of all, there's an extended period of time in the Bible called the last days. Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, Peter on the day of Pentecost, Jesus has now ascended back to the right hand of God the Father. They've been waiting in the upper room in Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit is outpoured upon them, and Peter begins to preach a gospel message, and he says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out 
out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And so here Peter says, this is now the inauguration. This is the beginning of the last days. And so the second thing to understand is that these last days began when Jesus ascended to heaven. As soon as Jesus left the planet, after his resurrection, he goes to the Mount of Olives, and he's taken up into glory, seated at the right hand of God the Father, and at his ascension, the last day countdown began. Talk about maybe a, a football game, and in a football game, there are four quarters in a football game, and there's the beginning of the game and the end of the game, and there's a game clock that goes along with it. And that game clock, when does the game clock start? The game clock starts as soon as the kickoff occurs, right? And as soon as the kickoff occurs, everything is a countdown from that point forward. There are different seasons. There are four seasons or four quarters, you might say, or if you're a baseball fan, there are nine innings. And so you're moving from the first inning to the ninth inning or the first quarter to the fourth quarter. And that's the way we need to view history that we've started. When Jesus went back to heaven, that began inning number one or the first quarter of the last days. And we're progressively moving toward the fourth quarter or the ninth inning of the last days. And the game clock is ticking down each and every day. Every day of your life and my life, we are closer to the end every day. So there's a progressive process. Number three, certain signs remind and warn us of the coming last days. How do we know when we're getting near the fourth quarter? Wouldn't it be nice to know? How do we know that we're getting near the ninth inning? How do we know that we're getting near the end? Where there are certain signs. What does a sign do? A sign gives you information. A sign points you in a direction. And so the scripture gives us signs. Jesus himself gives us signs. In Matthew chapter 24, it's one of the classic passages. It's called in theological terms, the Olivet Discourse. It's called, it's where Jesus spent time with his disciples on the Mount of Olives and he taught talk to them about the coming last days, some of which Jesus talked about and predicted and prophesied was fulfilled in 70 AD when Titus, the Roman emperor, comes into Jerusalem and destroys Jerusalem, destroys the temple, and Jesus is prophesying about that that is going to occur about 40 years from the time that he is having this conversation with his disciples, but there were other things that went beyond that moment. Listen to what he says. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? We need some signs. We want to know when it's the fourth quarter. We want to know when it's the ninth inning. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear. Notice he's describing the signs of the last days. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. These are the words of Jesus himself. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Let me stop there for a moment. I have obviously not experienced birth pains, okay? But my wife has, okay? And I've been with her watching that process with the birthing both of our daughters many years ago. And birth pains, for those of you who have given birth, you understand they start out mild and mildly, but they build over time. And when are the most intense contractions? Right when the birth is about to happen. And so here Jesus is saying, these are the beginnings of birth pains. You're going to see these are the contractions, if you will, that the wor world is contracting and showing that something is about to happen. And I'll get to this more in a moment. But as we get closer to the end times, what happens with those birth pains? They become more intense. The contractions become more severe. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but in essence, that's what Jesus is talking about. All these are the beginning of 
of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will, be, and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Let's stop there for a moment. Jesus said, here's some signs. During that time and the closer you get to the end, people start turning away from their faith. Can I ask you, how strong is your faith? Because as you get toward the last days, many will begin to turn away from their faith. Many will betray and hate each other. How are the relationships in your life? Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. How well do you know your Bible? How well do you know the truth of God's word? And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. How is your love level? What if we were to take a love temperature and measure love in your heart? How warm would your love be toward other people? Or is your love toward others growing cold because of bitterness and resentment in your life? Jesus said these are signs of the last days. We'll come to more of them in just a moment. Verse 13, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved and and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then what will happen? The end will come. So please note with me. I'm going to try to give you the best illustration possible with a limited hand movement here, okay? In the trajectory of history, once Jesus ascended, what, what countdown clock did that start? You guys been listening? I got to go back over all this again? Okay, okay. When Jesus ascended, what did that start? What countdown clock did that start? Boom, last day started right then. Jesus went back, last day clock started, okay? Over a period of time until Jesus comes back again, there are two simultaneous things that happen. Number one, the gospel is being preached. People are getting saved. Nothing can hinder the gospel, amen? Amen. Nothing can hinder the advance of God's kingdom. It will continue to work until the last day that Jesus comes back again. Why? Because he's sitting on his throne, ruling and reigning. His spirit is at work in the world through his church. And so the gospel of the kingdom will continue to be preached to all the nations. I'm glad to be a part of that movement. How about you? Amen? Now, at the same time, at the same time that the gospel is being preached, what else is going to happen? Contractions, birth pains, tribulations, wars and rumors of wars, intensify, intensification of all these things, people falling away from the faith, people's love growing cold, people being deceived because they don't understand the truth of God's word. The same time that this is occurring, this undercurrent of evil is occurring as well. This is what the scripture teaches us. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Now, by the way, folks, I'm not trying to scare you today. Somebody says, oh, I came to church today, and man, I'm scared out of my liver. Good gracious. I want to get some comfort. Yeah, let me tell you something. You can trust God to carry you through whatever will happen in the world. I promise you, okay? You can trust him. He's, he's going to take care of his people in the midst of it, but you need to be close to him in the process, okay? But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. Don't, don't think that you're going to miss any terrible times uh, because last days, are, are that's a part of it. People, here he describes it. See if you can identify with the world around us. He tells us the characteristics. People will be lovers of themselves. Check. Lovers of money. Check. Boastful, proud, abusive, check. Disobedient to their parents. Parents said, check. (laughs) Ungrateful, check. Unholy, check. Without love, check. Unforgiving, check, check. (laughs) Slanderous, check. Without self-control, check. Brutal, check. Not lovers of the good, check. Treacherous, check. Rash, check. Conceited, check. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, check. Having a form of godliness but denying its power, check. Have nothing to do with such people. Don't let that 
infect you or contaminate you. And here's the fourth thing you need to know about the last days, signs of the last days. I've already mentioned this, but I want to sort of bring it to its major point. Signs of the last days will accelerate and intensify as the world nears the last day. Remember, there are last days and there is the last day. Got me? Last days, just another quick pop quiz for you. When did the last days begin? When Jesus ascended, the countdown clock is moving toward the last day, and signs of the last days will accelerate and intensify as the world nears that final day. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. This is a long reading, but I want to give it to you, so you need to hear this. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. No, it hasn't already come. Okay. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness Talking here about, I believe, the Antichrist, the book of Revelation uh, speaks of this particular person as the beast. Here it's referred to as the lawless man of lawlessness or man of sin. He says rebellion is going to occur. The man of sin or lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God and his, or his worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he's taken out of the way, and then the lawless one that is the Antichrist, the beast, will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will, will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Here it's pointing to the fact of the intensification of evil until the very end where there's a very clear clash between light and darkness and there's this moment where now to rescue this world that's under the influence of of a power called the Antichrist, Satan himself embodied in a person, again, as I mentioned, called the beast in the book of Revelation or the man of lawlessness, as Paul refers to him here. And all of this evil comes to this point where there is a great battle of the last days, whether it physically happens in the, in the uh, Valley of Armageddon. I'm not sure. I've stood many times and looked over the Valley of Armageddon. It's the most perfect battlefield in the world. We don't know exactly how it's going to transpire in the end, but we know there'll be a culminating moment and Jesus Christ will come back and by his breath, he'll slay the Antichrist and the beast and the devil will be thrown in the abyss forever and ever and forever. Now that's, by the way, that's what you call last days for dummies, okay? That's just, that's like, like, that's like the Cliff Notes version, okay? There's a whole lot more that you could understand about this, but I'm just trying to give you a basic understanding of this uh, so we'll grasp it. Final point here today, Jesus will return to earth. Amen. History will come to a conclusion with a dramatic cataclysmic event and events. There'll be a variety of events that will transpire on that last day, last days leading to that last day. Peter again describes this. Listen as he's seeing into the future what's going to happen. But the day of the Lord will come. We read that a moment ago. Like a thief, the heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way. So it's going to be a day when things will not only be 
brought to life, as we'll see in a moment, but also destroyed. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward. Notice, not dreading, but looking forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destructions of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. The Bible says that on that last day, the earth as we know it, in its form and its dimension under its curse that it's lived under since the time time of Adam and Eve, it will be destroyed, and in the midst of that destruction will come not only uh, the destruction of the world as we have known it, but the judgment of mankind will happen in what's called the great white throne judgment, and I don't have time to go into that today. We'll touch on that a bit more, Lord willing, next weekend, but there'll be this amazing moment, and then out of it all, God will do something incredible, and this is the beautiful thing that we look forward to, that God will create a new heavens and a new earth. See, earth is not going to disappear forever. God's just going to make it new, okay? And so when you thought, oh, I'm going to finally get away from this place. No, you're not. You're going to be back on this place, but it's going to be a place of paradise because heaven, according to the scriptures, heaven and earth will be molded into one And in fact, is that not what Jesus said? He said, pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it's done in heaven. And Peter was so excited about that. And I'm pretty excited about that too. How about you? Because I think this earth has some beautiful things about it. How about you? Amen? And it's going to be even more. Can you imagine what it was like to be in the Garden of Eden before the fall of mankind? We're talking about paradise restored. So no, you are not going to float around on a cloud for eternity playing some dumb harp, okay? Okay, you're not going to do that, okay? We'll leave that to David and the angels. They can do that, okay? And if you like playing the harp, awesome. You'll probably be able to play the harp, okay? But we will be fulfilled in everything that God made us to be. As I talked about last week, you'll be the best you you will, could have ever been because you're now without any kind of limitations in your life, living in an atmosphere that is completely void of sin and the curse, a new heaven and a new earth. Peter said, I'm looking forward to that. And I want you to be looking forward to it as well, a promise that God has clearly given to us. And this day of the Lord is connected to the coming of Jesus Christ. And let me just say this as we're concluding. I have a few more scriptures I want to read for you, and we're going to conclude. As surely as Jesus came the first time, fulfilling all the prophecies of his first coming, there are many, many prophecies Perhaps as many or more prophecies, I haven't specifically counted them, but certainly a significant number of prophecies about the second coming of Jesus. And if Jesus fulfilled every promise in his first coming, he will fulfill every promise in his second coming. Jesus will come back just as he declared and just as he promised. Listen to these words and let them stir your heart to look forward to that day. By the way, let me say something else. When he comes back this time, the first time he came as the suffering servant. When he comes back again, he comes back as the conquering king of kings and lord of lords, okay? Acts 1, 10 and 11. Let these verses sink in as we wrap up today. They were looking, the disciples, this is now Jesus has just ascended. They watched him go up into the clouds And so they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back the same way you have seen him go into heaven. John 14, Jesus words himself, do not, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there, going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come 
back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time. Not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Revelation 1, 7. John the revelator sees this. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Revelation 22, 12, the words of Jesus himself. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they've done. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. for whenever talking about communion, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Revelation 19, listen to these words. These are, this is our last passage. John says, he was on the Isle of Patmos, and he has this revelation in the Spirit. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. By the way, as a side note, that's where the hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns, comes from. Perhaps you remember that from, uh, from your church experience. On his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean, coming out of his mouth as a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of of the wrath of God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. One of the most consistent themes of the New Testament, and actually you find it in the Old Testament as well, is the promise and the hope of the second coming of Jesus Christ. This was so important to early Christians that when they would gather for worship, They would gather to celebrate Jesus and celebrate the Lord's table and celebrate their fellowship in Christ. That often they would use a word among one another. We might say things like, peace to you, brother, God bless you, things like this. But here's a word that they would often speak to one another in their early gatherings. They believed in and trusted in and hoped for the second coming of Jesus so strongly that often they would say to one another, Maranatha. And the word Maranatha means this, Lord, come quickly. Lord, we so desire your second coming. We so look forward to the day that you will wrap up all things in yourself and that you'll bring that new heaven and new earth that we declare and we pray, Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And may today that be our prayer as well. Don't dread the final day live in view of the final day because it is not only the final day it is the greatest day that the world will ever know would you bow your heads together with me as we pray today father we thank you for your word we're grateful that we're able to study scripture and understand just a little bit about what's happening in the end of times and i pray that something that's been said today would stir our hearts toward a deeper relationship with you that Something that's said today would cause us to recommit our lives to you and to look forward to that great and glorious day of your coming when you split the sky. You call us together to be with you for eternity and a new heaven and a new earth. For that, we thank you in Jesus' name. I would like to close today by giving you an opportunity to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me right now? Right where you are, just simply bow your head with me, and I'm going to give you a prayer to pray. And you can simply speak this prayer out, whisper this prayer out, and from the sincerity of your heart, call upon God, and I promise you that He will hear and answer you. So let's pray together. Start by simply whispering the name Jesus. Let there come uh, from your heart just the declaration of His name. Say, Jesus, I know that, that I am a sinner, that I have fallen short with you. I'm sorry for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are God's Son. I believe that you are the Savior of the world. I believe that you died on the cross 
for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you are alive today. Now pray these words. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a new start in you. I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to encourage you with a promise from God's Word that says that when we call upon God's name, we call upon the Son of God, there is salvation that comes to our lives. He changes us from the inside out, and you become a new creation. All things pass away. All things become new. And that's exactly what has happened to you today. Your next step really is to make sure that you get into a good Bible-believing church. And you begin to study God's Word, get God's Word in you, and to make sure that you get a copy of the Bible if you don't have one and begin to read it. Spend some time every day in prayer. And I would encourage you also to check out the resources on our website that will help you to get going in your relationship with Jesus. You can find them at church-redeemer.org. Get those into your hands. Get started in your new life with Jesus Christ. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.